Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muqtada Khan, your host. And today I'm going to talk to you about a speech that India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, gave at the Hudson Institute uh, this morning. It was a, a very interesting speech in which he talked about India's role and how India sees uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy. He also talked about Quad and its significance. And then he took uh, several questions from the audience uh, and then he answered them. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was an excellent performance, uh, actually a brilliant performance uh, by the foreign minister who is uh, having a great tour of Washington. He was here for, for the UN General Assembly meeting where he gave a very good speech. Uh, and uh, uh, if you recall last week, I posted a, a Hindi commentary on the speech. Uh, uh, you can uh, watch it if you like by looking at my recent videos. Uh, and then after that, he he went to the Council on Foreign Relations and gave a very interesting uh, speech at the Council on Foreign Relations. At the UN, he talked mostly about India's achievements uh, as a result of uh, hosting the G20 presidency and the summit. Uh, and he also talked about very broadly about how India sees the world and what contributions India can make to the world. At the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, he talked a little bit more about the changing balance of power in the world. Uh, and uh, I still have a mind uh, to do a commentary on that speech. Uh, and so I will not sp say much, but I like that one too. Uh, that was uh, slightly different from the one in the Hudson Institute, where at the Hudson Institute, uh, he was uh, uh, asked uh, to focus on the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, Indo-Pacific region, the Quad, and basically on US-India uh, relations. Uh, so before I actually get into the specifics, uh, of the speech, uh, uh, I have several notes, as you can see, uh, and points to make. Uh, I would like you all of you who have been watching Conversations and have not subscribed to it yet, please subscribe to Conversations, like the video, ring the bell icon so that you get notifications of my future video submissions, which are now more or less one daily. Uh, and I will also request those of you who like uh, what I offer here to consider joining conversations. You can join conversations by pressing the button join, which is right next to the button to subscribe. Uh, and I will also post a link to join in the description in the video. And in the description of the video also, I will post links to my analysis of Dr. Jay Shankar's speech at the UN. And I will also post links to his speeches at the Council on Foreign Relations and at the Hudson Institute. Um, ANI was basically streaming it live. So if you go to the ANI's uh, YouTube channel, you can actually see the speech uh, anytime. So you're most welcome to watch it after you watch uh, my discussion and analysis of the speech. So the, the conversation was basically moderated by Walter Russell Mead, who's a very prominent columnist for the Wall Street Journal, has been writing about international relations for decades. Uh, and uh, uh, he wrote a very interesting book called uh, Providence on, on, on American Foreign Policy, in which he talks about four approaches to American foreign policy. And I did a conversation on that. Uh, I will also share a link to that in the video description, the four ways in which uh, it's a very interesting and elegantly designed uh, paradigm that uh, Walter Russell Mead constructed. It always just sparks interest. And for those of you who teach uh, American foreign policy, that would be a very good video to use I use it every time now when I do teach American foreign policy and the students like it and talk about it. I have also used that uh, paradigm in a, uh, in a couple of op-eds that I've written in the past, including one uh, very critical of uh, President Biden's foreign policy. So Dr. Jay Shankar uh, starts by talking about uh, the fact that uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific region has clearly become very important, uh, the Pacific region, primarily because of the shift in the focus of the global economy. Now, America does more business uh, with Asia than it did with Europe in some ways. Uh, and India, too, uh, according to Dr. Jay Shankar, which we also know is true, uh, that uh, India does more business towards East than it does towards the West. So India is deeply engaged with the Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, and uh, so, and because the 
to focus the epicenter of the global economies now in Asia, given the fact that some of the top economies in the world. So if you look at the top five, uh, three of them are in Asia, India, China, and Japan. Uh, and therefore, clearly, it is the most important region in the world. And also given the fact uh, that uh, the latest uh, geopolitical contest is for global leadership is now appears to be between the United States and China. And that context uh, is in the Indo-Pacific region where China is seeking to, with a newly acquired large Navy, the biggest Navy in the world now belongs to China. It's trying to put a lot of pressure in the Indo-Pacific region. And therefore the strategic significance of that region has gone really high up. Well, these are most of my comments. Uh, what, what Dr. Jaishankar basically was trying to say was that there is a rebalancing taking place in the world. And there he was implying that, uh, it was very interesting. He was implying that the United States is, uh, unable or does not have the capacity to deal with the challenge of China on its own. Uh, uh, and there are new powers emerging. And therefore, given the fact that the United States priorities are changed and the fact that its position has changed, and these are Dr. Jaishankar's words, uh, it's looking towards Indo-Pacific with new allies such as India. And in that context, he talks about Quad and uh, without saying much, he actually implies that there are reasons why the Quad has been so much more successful in its second iteration since 2017, uh, without explaining why he thought it fell in 2007. Uh, clearly, the, uh, the, there are two reasons uh, which he did not find out. One is the growing competition between the US and China. Uh, and the other, obviously, is uh, the growing, uh, shall we say, deteriorating situation between India and China. So, and therefore, the salience of Quad increases. Uh, he also talked about something which is very interesting. He says that the goal of the Quad, and particularly US uh, and India and their partnership, is to bring stability in this era where there is tremendous upheaval and turmoil and change, both at the Council on Foreign Relations and at the UN, and also here at Hudson. Dr. Jay Shankar emphasize the fact that the global structure is in a state of flux, that there is significant shifts taking place. And one major shift is the fact that India went from uh, being the sixth to the fifth biggest economy. That makes a lot of difference in the structure of world politics. Uh, so as the economic power of countries rises, uh, uh, um, the balance of power also shifts. And uh, Dr. Jaishankar said in his talk that one way to gauge that is by just looking at the list of the G20. And if you see uh, the changes in the rankings of the top 20 economies, you can clearly understand uh, the change in the structure of uh, the global economy. In fact, uh, if you look at the, the, the global economy in a purchasing power parity index, uh, you will find that of the top eight countries, economies in the world, the top four are BRIC, the original BRIC, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. So with China number one, India number three, Russia number five, uh, and uh, Brazil number eight in the top eight economies. So in that sense, there is a definite change uh, in the global structure. And uh, Dr. Jay Shankar then basically uses this to essentially pound the existing global order. Uh, and uh, he basically points out that India as the world's largest uh, country in terms of population, the entire continent of Africa, both are not represented in, in the permanent membership of the UN Security Council that tells us how out of touch uh, the United Nations and the UN Security Council is with the realities of the world today. And therefore, so he feels that there has to be a change uh, in the world structure. And this was in actually a response uh, to a question by Walter Russell Mead, where he tried to ask if India was uh, seeking to transform or reform the global order. Uh, and uh, clearly, the United States is a status quo power, and India wants change. So, so it was interesting uh, to 
to hear Dr. Jay Shankar say it so clearly that the institutions of global governance do not represent the reality of the world today. Uh, I think the most, he made two very important points, which I think are critical to US India relations. Uh, and I'll try to be as uh, as uh, accurate in exactly what he said, uh, because my notes often also include my comments on it. So the, one of the points that he made, which I think is very important, is that the change uh, in the US-India relations is that until now they were dealing with each other, but they have changed from dealing with each other to working with each other, which is very interesting. So you could have a relationship in which each uh, the, the two partners could be working to accommodate each other's interests, uh, to, to somehow deal with divergences in, the, that, in those interests, uh, to find a way to compromise, uh, to look the other way, uh, to, to bear the cost of some divergences, et cetera. So that's, when that is happening, you're dealing with each other. Uh, but he's saying that the United States and the US, uh, India do not ha have gone beyond that stage. Today they are working together. Now, I wish he would have pointed out what other, where are they working together? And I'm sure they'll give you a plethora of things, but which are all usually Indo-US cooperation. They're cooperating on defense issues. They're sharing intelligence. Well, that is the same thing with uh, US and other allies. Uh, besides the fact that they are working together, uh, to maintaining order in the Indo-Pacific, uh, bringing stability to Indo-Pacific, containing the rising power of China in that region. This is where they are definitely working together. I agree with him on that. But uh, I would like to also know what other areas are there where uh, India and U.S. are working together uh, rather than dealing with each other. So that's something uh, interesting to know. Um, I'm sure they will talk about uh, green energy and green technology in that context, but I'm more interested in how specifically they are doing things which are in the interest of the global uh, world rather than just these two countries. When are they working together rather than just dealing with each other beyond uh, trying to contain China? The second interesting point that he made uh, was to say that India is a non-West country. So it's not a Western country, but India is not an anti-West country. That's a very interesting point. That means that he also does argue that, that the con contemporary world is a construct of the West. So the West has constructed the existing global order. And if you are against that order, you might be anti-West, like China, for example, or Russia, definitely. Uh, so even though Russia sees itself as a European power, it is anti-West because it is completely opposed to the Western order that was created by Western countries, much to the detriment of the Soviet Union and now Russia. So when he makes the point that India is, while being a non-Western country, is not anti-West, he's also signaling that India is not, not really trying to overturn the Western apple cart. What India is trying to do is find a place for itself. So it's not trying to destroy the Western table. It just wants a seat at the table and, and preferably one of the more important ones, uh, if not the most important seat at the table. So that's an interesting point. So I think these are the two important points he made in the speeches. Uh, he took several questions. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, three of them because uh, they were interesting to me. Uh, wherever he's going, whether it was at Council on Foreign Relations or at the Hassan Institute, the first question is inevitably about uh, the status of minorities and the way India is treating minorities, etc. So he's taking the question and answering them. His answer at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, I'm not very sure. It, it was a question asked by one of the foreign editors of Foreign Affairs who basically uh, was talking about how the decline of India's rankings on uh, VDEM and the Democracy Index, the fact that India, at least in, in uh, charts uh, and measures by human rights organizations, is declining in democracy, is that going to impede India's rise as a global power? 
in that question, he basically said that, oh, no, none of these uh, indices count. They're all ideological and just dismissed them. Uh, that is not an answer that is going to win points for him here in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world except back home in India and only with the supporters of his political party. So if he's acting as a diplomat and representing India to the rest of the world, uh, then his answer is completely unsatisfactory to the rest of the world. That much I can tell you. And you will probably read about it in uh, most of the media across the world. His answer was designed only to uh, make uh, his party supporters back home in India happy. And the same question was asked again here. And this time by Walter Russell. Well, I don't know whether someone sent a question in or whether he popped the question himself. He referred to how... Uh, a very prominent Christian leader had uh, asked him about India's situation in the minorities, clearly referring to what is happening in Manipur. And there again, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar gave a broad philosophical answer about how India is pluralistic, etc., without going to into any specific events. And uh, uh, other than telling people that there is a lot of diversity in India and uh, uh, and that India is now becoming a welfare state. So the point that he made is there is no discrimination against minorities in the welfare that is being provided uh, to the minorities. Uh, I'm not very sure that the, the data will support that with uh, the growing disparity uh, between uh, uh, academic achievements, economic achievements, etc., between various religious communities in India. Uh, and the economic and conditions and living conditions. Uh, I don't think that the case can be made that there is no discrimination in, in provisions of welfare uh, and definitely doesn't talk about security or violence at all. The fact that there are people in India calling for genocide, uh, there are people who are being paraded naked and their videos are being made. Uh, hundreds of people have been lynched for what they eat. In America, we eat billions of burgers. Will, will Hindus start lynching Americans for eating beef? Uh, so, But they do that in India for trafficking, for alleged trafficking. So there are a lot of those kind of events happening. Uh, uh, and he did not touch upon anything. And there's a lot of coverage of such things in the United States, at least. And so his answer on that was not satisfactory. His answer, however, on the Canada question was quite brilliant. Um, Walter Russell Mead presented the question, interestingly, to say that, oh, the U.S. and India are in the same boat. Canada gives moral lectures to both the U.S. as well as Canada. And so Dr. Jai Shankar basically said, perhaps Canada sees the United States as if it is part of the global south. So that was an interesting joke. Uh, it's quite possible some Canadians, from a moral and democratic point of view, given the fact that they have free health care and free education, really think of the United States as a global stop, except when it comes to security and, and then protecting them from others <laughs> like China and now India. Then they come running to daddy. But anyway, the interesting part is that in his answer, uh, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar basically elaborated the role of uh, Canada in uh, basically allowing Sikh extremism uh, and separatism to nurture. He talked about the nexus between uh, Sikh extremism or extremism and uh, terrorism and crime and as to how all of these uh, activities are, are kind of nurtured and tolerated by Canada for political purposes and therefore implying that India has a grievance which has been there for a while without Canada responding to it. But we also learned that uh, both, he, that he had a long conversation with uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken as well as with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on this issue. So the media reports uh, this morning when I saw in India, especially I think Hindustan Times is reporting that just because the United the State Department's readout did not refer uh, to to whether Tony Blinken had raised this issue with uh, Dr. Jay Shankar or not, they indicated that oh somehow the United States had put aside uh, the Canadian. Uh, request that the U.S. raise this issue with India. In fact, uh, uh, 
Trudeau had uh, actually made a public statement saying that uh, this issue will be raised by Anthony Blinken, and he did. And they had Dr. Jay Shankar, without revealing what was discussed, did talk about this. And the standard answer that Dr. Jay Shankar is basically giving is this: Look, unless you give us something specific, uh, we cannot do anything about it. So give us some specific thing, and we will look at it. Basically. He's thrown the ball back in uh, Canada's court. Uh, and so unless Trudeau ponies up with some hard evidence that Indian diplomats were indeed involved in the assassination of, of the Sikh activist slash terrorist Nijar, uh, nothing is going to happen further. Uh, but India's rhetoric and uh, uh, is definitely up against Canada. So you can assume that in order for now for Canada to improve relations with India and bring it back to what it was last week or, or 10 days ago, uh, it will have to produce some hard evidence or apologize to India. And then that probably is not going to happen. And one other interesting question was asked about uh, the, the various um, minilateral initiatives that are taking place, uh, India's role in various, and eventually the question was about SARC, basically, as to why is India active in other places, but not in SARC. And Dr. Jaishankar said it very, very clearly uh, that uh, it is because one of the members of, of SARC uh, uh, practices uh, cross-border terrorism and until that continues to happen. It's not going to happen. So basically, the United India is not interested in working with Pakistan in any multilateral forums uh, and uh, or bilaterally, for that matter. Uh, it's only when, oh, I think my light went out. Uh, it is only when uh, it is forced to interact, like play Pakistan in the ICC World Cup, that you can anticipate India to be in a multilateral situation with Pakistan, but it's very clear that until uh, there is an end to cross-border terrorism uh, uh, to India's satisfaction, you cannot expect uh, much cooperation. There were questions about the instability in Pakistan, uh, and uh, Dr. Jaishankar basically implied that he sees that Pakistan's problems are endemic and long-term, and things are not really going to get better anytime soon. He did refer to, to the problems of uh, Sri Lanka and said India did help Sri Lanka uh, with about $4 billion package uh, to deal with its situation. Uh, he doesn't foresee any such situation with Pakistan, also because unlike Sri Lanka, he thinks that Pakistan's problems are much more complex, historical, uh, and may take a long time uh, to resolve themselves. Uh, so I hope you found this discussion uh, informative uh, and interesting for those of you who have not watched the speech. I would recommend you go and watch. It's very interesting. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, he's doing an incredible job for India, undoubtedly. I mean, look at this this whole visit to Washington. He, he, he's dealing with think tanks. He's dealing with international organizations. He's dealing with national security and diplomatic institutions. Uh, and he's, he's having a good time here and is representing India well. Uh, he comes across as, when it comes to foreign policy, clearly he's a Vishwa Guru. He is not only just representing India, but he's teaching everybody else about the nature of world politics today, uh, about how international relations are, what's happening in the world, what should be done by responsible powers. Anyway. I hope you found this discussion and conversation interesting. Uh, so please subscribe to Conversations, like the video, share it with your friends, uh, uh, ring the bell icon. And if you would like to support Conversations, please join Conversations. You will find the button to join right next to the button to subscribe. I will also post a link in the video description to join. I will also post a link in the video description to two of the speeches from Dr. Jai Shankar. I will also post a link to my uh, commentary on his UN speech uh, and uh, and also to the conversation about Walter Russell meets uh, four ways of thinking about American foreign policy. So until next time, this is your host, Muhtadar Khan. Take care, be happy.